Welcome to Daily Devotion with Ken Gurley. Devotions designed to inspire you on your daily walk with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Hey, wonderful Thursday morning, Daily Devotion family. Good to see each and every one of you. Miriam, Shannon, Roy, Larry, you guys. You guys are amazing. For those of you just joining us, this is the Daily Devotion family. Let's see, DD 2024. And uh, we've been doing this uh, consistently uh, starting just before the COVID outbreak. I know that was BC and been doing this for several years now. And it's always been a joy. It's never old to me. I look forward to it every morning. I've been walking around. I, I've had a choir singing me. I, I've had the Chicago Mass Choir singing with me this morning. I've been singing some old gospel spirituals. Yeah, we had a good time this morning around the house of and just worshiping God and thanking God. God is good all the time, all the time. do want to say a special thank you Church family, thank you. Thank you for uh, showing such love and support yesterday uh, for Christopher and family, time of need. Uh, Amy, Jason, Jason Jr., Rain, all of the family, heaven in our church. You guys, um, thank you for that. A great showing of support. We got home yesterday evening and uh, immediately turned around and headed back to MD Anderson. And those of you who have not heard, we, we, we witnessed the home going of one of our dearly beloved ministers in the Houston area. I, I've said he is probably the most loved minister in all of Houston, um, Brother Roger Blackburn. I don't know how we're gonna fill that gap, and, um, but he received his elevation uh, last night and pray for the Blackburn family and and each and all of them um, and we'll be sharing more as the family gives us more about the homegoing celebration I I'm just thankful for the life of brother Roger Blackburn in fact it was a song that he sang that got me looking this morning and I hit some of those old gospel songs on YouTube and have just been giving thanks to God, giving thanks to God for all that he's done for us. So thank you for being you. Thank you for being a part of this. And um, have you ever gotten tired of starting over? Etta, Janie, have you just ever gotten tired of it? Just an endless repetitious cycle of trying, failing, trying again. I have a word from you. It's straight from the Lord. And I think the word of God uh, can speak into this situation. I will tell you this. If you ever get tired of starting over and over again, consider spring. Consider the lilies of the field. Each and every year they start over again. And um, in some parts of the United States where the climate is temperate and they, they do crops all year around, it's almost a perpetual cycle of starting over again. So don't feel like when you're in a holding pattern or you're, you feel like you're just going around and round in circles. I believe that God so ordains it that we're not just going around in circles, we're spiraling upward to Him. That there is a elevation question in everything we do. That when God has us start over again, it's for a new purpose. We're going to learn something new. I can't tell you how many of the stories uh, I've read through the years of authors who have penned books. This is before digital technology and saving things in the cloud and who have penned their magnum opus, their greatest work, and it's finished only for a fire to hit and that work be destroyed. And uh, that momentary loss that something so precious is gone but then they would set out to rewrite it, and it was far better than what the original was. This is what I believe God does for us, that we are moving into a bright day, and it grows ever brighter, that when God has us start over, 
It's to make it better than what it once was. Is that all right? I just, I just feel that. I felt that in the Lord this morning and just prayer. And so I have a word to you from the word of God. Now, I want to say something about the last days in the word of God. We are living in the last of the last days. We are there. Sue, Roy, we're there. We are in the last of the last days. I believe the word of God becomes more precious to us as we see that end time approach. That the word of God will become not only just a catalyst for great things, but the word of God will become our sounding board because we know that in the last days, sound doctrine will be rejected in favor of a more pleasurable message by the people with itching ears. Hear hear me carefully, Kurt Evelyn. Hey, Sister Holmes, one of my favorite Bible teachers right there, Evelyn Holmes. Wow. What an impact she's had on my life and so many people's lives. We love you, Sister Holmes. I, um, I, one of the things that I, I have just noticed, and, I, and I, I read a prophecy a few days ago, a prophecy that was given many, many years ago. And I, I had stored that prophecy, and I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know if this is really accurate. But that in the last days, the the fight that we will have is not between uh, good and bad, not between light and darkness. It's not going to be that stark, that it will be between those who have genuine faith and those who only profess faith, that the war will be amongst those who have a form of religion but deny the power thereof, that It will be between the genuine and the synthetic. Remember, antichrist means false anointing, false anointed one. That the idea will be between the genuine and the counterfeit. How much more do we need the word of God in such a day as this? So I have a word. I have a word for you. This This is from the minor prophet Haggai later in his life. In the opening chapter, then spake Haggai, the Lord's messengers, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I'm with you, I'm with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all of the remnant of the people, And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. There's one of those beautiful expressions, the Lord of hosts. Oh, I love that expression. The characters, let me give you the lay of the land in Haggai 1. We got three main characters, Darius, many Persian kings known as Darius. And I I hate to say this, but lots of luck figuring out which one is which. We tend to believe this is the fourth uh, king named Darius. But suffice it to say, he was one of the Persian kings who ruled in Babylon. You remember Babylon, the head of gold, had given way to the chest of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire. So we have Darius, the Persian king. We have Zerubbabel. His name means born in Babylon. Indeed, he was. This grandson of the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, was born in captivity. Babylon fell to Darius. Zerubbabel was given permission then to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the broken down temple of Jehovah. And that's what Zerubbabel did. And then we have Haggai. Did I say Zerubbabel? I think I got one, one too many bull. I think I had one too many syllables, bus syllables. In there. So we have Darius Zerubbabel. There, I think I got that one right. And we have Haggai. Haggai was this elderly prophet who, along with a young prophet, this new kid on the block named Zechariah, began to challenge the people of God, rebuild the temple, let's go. Let's start over again. Let's get this thing going. So the order to rebuild the temple was given in 538 BC. What a heady, exciting time it was. They were starting over again. Hopes were high, revival in the air. Thousands turned their back on false gods and prepared to raise this mighty edifice to Jehovah. 
But in Haggai 1, it's 17 years later. I mean, 17 years before they'd started with high hopes. Now, <clears throat> the girly translation, a little East Texas, Southeast Texas lingo, ne'er nothing had happened. The flame had died out. They'd made a good start, but it was just a good start, and the romantic notions could not face reality. The idealism, the idealism couldn't face the fact. And you know what happens then, status quo sets in. A lot of reasons for the stall. I've, I, I was looking this morning, you compare the writings of Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah. I, I can give you several reasons that stop forward progress. Here's number one. Number one, it's harder than what it seemed. Yeah. How many times do we want to start over, but it's just harder. It's harder than what we anticipated. Hi. The going gets tough. And we like to say we're going to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And when the going gets rough, the tough get going and et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is we get weary in well-doing. We, we wear out. We tire out. The task is harder. How many times have you and I wanted to do something for God and uh, we get this vision, we get this dream, but in the cold light of day, it's, it takes a lot more grit than what we imagine. It takes a lot more difficulty. Yes, that's one of the reasons why for 17 years the work stall, it was harder. It was harder. Here's the second reason. They were mocked by the lukewarm. If you go to Ezra 4, you're going to see that when they began to build this temple, those that came back from captivity and started building the temple, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers. They said, this, this group, this, how can I say it? The mixed multitude that were in the area. They came to Zerubbabel and said, you know what? Let us build with you. We, we sort of like your God, and we seek him as you do, so let us just kind of get involved. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said, No, no, you're the mixed multitude. You, you really don't care about this house. You just want to stop us from working. You see, these were the Samaritans of the area. They were a picture of the lukewarm individuals. The Samaritans were not completely Jewish, not completely Gentile, but in between worshipers. You remember I started this by saying in the last days, this prophecy I read, the fight will not just be between light and dark, good and evil. The fight will be between the shades of gray, between light and dark. It will be between the go-along and get-along bunch and the truly committed. Between the lukewarm individuals who just sort of want to be apart when the going is good. This is what the lukewarm did. They began to mock. They began to make fun. Ezra 4 says they determined they were going to weaken the hands of the people of Judah and trouble them in their building. They hired people. They got voices. They got influencers to do whatever they could to frustrate the people, then to go to Darius and Cyrus, kings of Persia, and try to mess up what was going on. Have you ever known people like that? Have you ever known people that if they're not in the limelight, if they're not the leader of the band, they're going to do whatever they can to frustrate the work of God and the good, godly efforts that are being made. Yes. So notice the process here. They weakened the hands of the builder. They troubled their, process, their progress. Then they hire professionals to frustrate the efforts with the king. And finally... When none of that worked, they just appealed to the king to stop 
everything. And guess what happened? But by the end of Ezra 4, everything had been shut down. Why do we have to start over again? We start over again because it's harder than we thought it was going to be. We didn't have the resources. We didn't sit down and count the cost. We started with this idealistic notion and uh, that everything was going to work out okay. And it didn't. And we get discouraged. And we don't want to go forward. Second reason we stop is the lukewarm. They begin to mock and they begin to throw roadblocks in our way. And we realize, we realize it was easier to follow the course of the world like a dead fish floating downstream than to fight against the current. Oh, day old dawn, I'm, I hope you still have your fight. I, I hope you still have the grit and the perseverance in you to say, rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy. I, I may fall. You, 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 you stopped me for 17 years. But I'm going to start over again. I'm going to get up again. And um, I'm going to try again. I love that word again. Again. That's the word of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to him a second time. It came again. Again. You may feel like, you may feel like a failure today. You may feel like you gave it your best shot. You tried. You gave all and didn't work out. So now you're just marking time. Can I just tell you? It may be 17 years. But God's going to come again, and the word of the Lord is going to come again, and you're going to sense a strength, a supernatural strength. It's what I've been praying for for you this morning. God, a supernatural strength to start over again. Do not look in the rearview mirror and not think about what's behind, but say, I've got this window of opportunity. I have these years left, and uh, I'm so blinded by the possibilities of where I am, that I'm forgetting about the failures of yesterday. It's time to start over again, folks. It's time to start over again. Wow. Wow. The third reason. The third reason. First, it was harder than it looked. Two, opposition. Three, they focused on themselves more than God. With a what's-the-use attitude. They began to take care of number one, and that became more important than the legacy, the, their progeny, the future, what they were leaving to people. I, I, I feel the Holy Ghost in this. Uh, the Bible says they built new, uh, wainscoted homes. They built themselves beautiful houses and said, well, we tried to build the house of God and it failed, so... Let's, let's bite off something we can chew and let's make ourselves comfortable. And for 17 years, they lived in palaces while weeds grew over their revival. Self had eclipsed revival. I want to say the only thing harder than starting is starting over. Starting over. I, Tessie and I used to drive by uh, headed east to Mississippi, we would drive by this old hulk of a church building. It was massive. It was beautiful. It was symmetrical, but it was unfinished and it was rusting. And through the years, we watched it decay. Someone had started with high hopes, but could never see it through. It takes blood, sweat, and tears to inaugurate some great task, deed. Yes, Jesus paid it all at the cross. But the life that you and I live and to see the mission furthered, it will take every day. And getting back in the groove is hard to do. Getting back in the groove. I talked to somebody the other day, they were a runner and they've been so athletic and so accustomed to running, a little health sat back and, and uh, they got out of the habit and they were talking to me how hard it is to get back in the groove of where they had once been. We know that feeling. We know that. We know that starting over is very difficult. Think of Moses, Exodus 31, went up to Sinai, given two, two tablets carved by the finger of God, the Bible says. It was the work of God. 
But in Exodus 32, he throws the tablets down and he's got to go back up that mountain in 34 and he's got to carve them out himself. It's always tough to start over again and again. You think of the shepherds from angels in the night sky over Bethlehem praising God to this massive star suspended above a manger to seeing the Christ child, the Messiah himself. Then they had to go back to those flocks in the hillside and start over again. It's tough to start over. Or what about Samuel? The night before, the voice of the Lord had spoke to him three times. When the cold light of day hit, we read that Samuel went and opened the doors of the house of God. I like to think that he did it with a little more joy and a little more enthusiasm, knowing that God had his number, knowing that God knew the way that he took. But how can opening doors to God's house compare to the voice of God that hadn't been heard in years, that it spoke to him in the night hour? Starting over is tough. The lesson is seen in God himself. Creation is difficult. Read Genesis 1. The voice and the chaos bringing order. Creation was the start, but redemption is starting over. And the price of redemption was his own blood. It's tough. It's tough to start over. He created with the spoken word. But redemption required the living word. It required flesh and blood. It required a sacrifice. His word alone separated the firmaments in creation, but in redemption, he would take a cross. In creation, man lived by the mere breath of God, but in redemption, it took the life of God, the precious blood. Here, I, I want to deal with this, and let me deal with this in closing. Discouragement results. Discouragement results from so many false starts. The chief product of false starts is discouragement. Haggai, he said, let me tell you where you're at, people. You've sown much, you're not bringing in much. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're never filled. You got clothes, but your, your closets are never satisfied. You earn wages, but... You got holes in your pockets. Thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. Consider from this day forward. Even from the day of the, when the foundation of the temple was laid, do you still have seed in the barn? Or you still got fruit on the vine, fig tree, pomegranate, the olive tree? You're looking at it and saying nothing's producing like it should. Don't you know that the day you decide I'm going to start over, I'm going to bless you? You wouldn't be human if you didn't get discouraged. I, I don't trust people who say I thrive on problems. I welcome adversity. I love the struggle. I don't trust people like that. No. Because I know our flesh. Like Gideon, we get discouraged because of the enemy. David gets discouraged by Satan's constant attacks through Saul. So much so that he gets so confused he stumbles into Goliath's hometown. We get discouraged. We have to encourage ourselves in the Lord. How do you do that? It's the stirring of the Spirit within us. How did Haggai stir up the people? He said, face the facts. Consider, consider, consider. He said that over and over again. Take heed to your ways. This is what the 39th Psalm said. I took heed to my ways. I looked at myself. The sorrow within me was stirred. Then I love verse 3. My heart was hot within me and while I was musing a fire burned and then I spoke with my tongue yes yes while I was musing while I was considering my ways and while I considered what God had for me a fire was rekindled on the inside of me the fuel to start over again came the tank got refilled. I was ready. The batteries got recharged. Whew. While I was musing and thinking about all that God had said, I felt the fire like Ephesus. Remember what it once was. Repent. Go back. 
do again the first works. This is what the Bible says. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the high priest. Then he stirred up the spirit of the people. Our spirit must be stirred. That's what begins. That's what begins when we want a new start. You can't put on the act. You can't have fake enthusiasm and no. There's got to be a stirring within the deep. While I was musing, a fire burned. Like Jeremiah, there was a fire in my bones. That same spirit that moved on the holy men of old. The enemy attacked and said, what you're building won't be glorious. But those people was Zerubbabel at the lead. Said, we're going to build it anyway. Because God is in it. We're going to do the first works again anyway because God is in it. I'm just bidding you, Loretta, Catherine, I just, I don't know why I'm feeling this, but I'm just feeling, Robin, I'm feeling that I'm supposed to tell you today, start over, start over. Quit weeping about the past. Yeah, I know they hurt you. I know they let you down. I know they disappointed you. I know it wasn't all that it was meant to be. But please get your eyes out of the rearview mirror and say, okay, God, I'm going forward. I'm ready to start over again. Empower me. And you remember, you remember, hey, Zerubbabel, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. You're going to move forward into this new dimension, into this new day with the anointing and the favor of the Almighty God. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, Anna, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. I don't know why. I'm just feeling really stirred in my spirit today. I want you to be stirred and be recharged and renewed and prepared to move forward again. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. I got boxes of stuff downstairs. We're getting ready to unload. I'm going to have to have people smarter than me to figure this one out. But thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and being a part of this. This is a vital part of my life, Tessie's life. And um, I'm glad we get to share it in your lives. If you're on Facebook, like, follow, and um, share. YouTube, subscribe, share this with others. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. May the Lord go with you into this Thursday and give you the strength to start all over again. God bless you. Thank you for sharing in daily devotion with Ken Gurley. We pray this ministry has been a source of encouragement and strength to you. Please be mindful that your financial support enables us to meet with you each day. To give a donation or connect with us, visit our website at kengurley.com. There you will also find the latest books, podcasts, and resources. Blessed 90 Days to Change Your World is Pastor Gurley's latest book. You can get your copy of this life-changing book at kengurley.com. May God's favor rest on you in every way until we meet again.